Have you ever wondered why there are so many quilt tops that are stored in closets or sold at antique shops? The creative part of the process is piecing the top. The finishing process, well, not as much fun and sometimes intimidating. This program kicks off a three-part series which takes a simple approach to finishing quilt projects, the borders, quilting, and binding. Whether your next quilt project is a small table topper or a great big queen size quilt, the techniques are the same. Let's start with borders. Fearless quilting finishes, that's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. Amazing designs and Class A needles. When talking about quilting on Sewing with Nancy, often I concentrate on the middle part of the design, kind of ignoring the borders and the bindings and sometimes the quilting process will not sew during this series. You might see some friends from the past Sewing with Nancy programs, borders that we pulled from previous projects. This shows an L-shaped border, the most simple type, and then simply a double border that you see on this table topper. I'm going to also show you how to insert a flange, a nice little bitty accent that just sets off a quilt project. And then corner stones, whether you have double corner stones or single, it carries through what you've seen in the rest of the quilt, kind of a nice finishing touch. It's basic, but if you haven't finished your quilt top, maybe one of these quilts will work for you, these quilt ideas. Now for the fabric. When you've chosen your fabric for your borders, do give it a little spray to begin with. We use a spray starch or a spray starch substitute so that it's like having a little extra stabilizer on your fabric. So just press that in so that it's nice and crisp. Most of the time, borders are cut on the cross grain from selvage to selvage. And we'd put a ruler on here, if you, no matter what size you'd cut, Whatever width you determine, you would cut that width and with the spray starch on there, it is nice and crisp and this is pretty normal. But professional quilters often cut the fabric for the borders, if they have enough, on the lengthwise grain. I've cut this on the lengthwise grain to show you that the selvage is still there and you may say, why do I do that? This is so much easier. Well, believe it or not, the way fabric is woven, even though it's woven, not knit, in the cross grain, it does have some stretch. And sometimes when putting borders on, you can warp a little bit, if you're very concerned about that, the shape of your design. When it's cut on the lengthwise grain, that's the most stable. It doesn't have that little give in it. And test that out on your fabric. If you have enough, cut the, cr the lengthwise grain instead of the crosswise. Truth be told, I most of the time cut the cross grain because cutting in the length grain takes a little bit more fabric. Now some of our samples are small, but it doesn't matter if it's a placemat to a king size bed, you're going to use the techniques in the same manner. So we'll just show you for the L-shaped quilt border, just the basic technique and how we like to work with it. So here's our mini, mini sample and showing a quilt top and the borders that we like to put on first are the short ends. So the border, the, and the reason for that is it eliminates a lot of the piecing. So for an L-shaped border, the north and south ends would go first, and then the east and west ends. But often, we've shortened this strip up, you always have to piece the fabric. And here we've used somewhat contrasting fabrics, just a slight gradation to show you when piecing the fabric, so what we like to do is create an L-shaped piecing technique. So you overlap the pieces like an L or, and then stitch from corner to corner. After trimming, you can see how that 
diagonal line is so much better than if you had a vertical line. It's less noticeable. So then you piece the north and south you've done, and then the east and west sides putting on the border. So after sewing the remaining sides, you're just going to have that simple L shape. Not too difficult. Very simple. I told you, it's fearless sewing, so the L shape border. A double border is great. Usually I make the inside border, the smaller border, the narrower. And you can make them equal sizes if you'd like. But the two often frame the piece very easily and you can pick out some of the, a darker color from the design. It's much like just using an L-shaped border, but this time you're going to, put it, going to put it on twice. So on our small sample, we'll show you that you do the north and south ends, the east and west ends, or side to side, top to bottom, however you'd like to call it. Then you'd add this final border. One is good, two is better in this instance, because then we can add borders on both sides. I always audition my fabrics, laying the pre-cut fabrics next to the design to make sure that these are the colors that I'd like to see. And you can see that double borders, I really am partial to them. They really help set off the design that's in the middle. Now granted, you're going to have a much bigger design than what we have right here. The next idea that I'd like to share with you is a flange. Now the flange is itty bitty, a really tiny little insert because it's so little, to get that minuscule but really nice piping effect added, you fold the fabric meeting wrong sides together and stitch it to the, the quilt top first of all. Let me show you on the sample that we have. We cut one inch strips of fabric. It doesn't have to be on the bias, it's just cut on the cross grain or the lengthwise grain and generally I just do the, the cross grain. It's one inch wide pressed in half so it's very small. And then you'd place this edge on the fabric and pin. And then position the border on top. Now if you'd like, you can stitch this down first and then stitch the bigger border on top. Now I've made or stitched this side. You can see that I've made it a little bit wider just so it was easier to see. But that little insert is so much easier to do than a narrow itty bitty border. So by having it folded. Let's go back and look at this project again. But I think that gives it a very neat finish. And you don't have to sew it twice. You just sew it once. Top stitch that flanged area into place. Then there comes cornerstones. So cornerstones on our big quilt that we have here is a block in each corner. You can have a single border or a double border, inner border, outer border, in the same manner. We just place a block in this area. Now there's a, the best way of putting these onto your quilt top is what I'd like to show you next. You sew the borders on the sides as I mentioned. The shorter ends, first of all. And here you can see it, they're pressed open. And I generally always press the fabric seam allowance to the borders. Because of the piece seams, it will naturally want to go that way. So now we have the top and bottom with the borders. Then you again measure the length plus seam allowances of the sides. And add cornerstones or just blocks. The blocks the same set width and length as the borders. So if this is a three inch border, you have a three inch block. And then the borders are stitched to the sides. And here we have it. So you can see that you're not putting a border on one or a quarter stone on one border or on each border, you're placing it on both ends. And that way you will end up with that nice effect as I showed you earlier. And we'll get the right end of the quilt. Here we go. So here we have a big border, a large cornerstone. Obviously, this cornerstone is the same width as that inner border. So it really carries things through. So in working with basic borders, you just have to measure the quilt, cut the strips, make sure you starch them first, and then choose one of these four options for your quilting enjoyment. 
framing a wall quilt is comparable to framing an art print or painting. Corners are mitered. Careful consideration is given to the colors, but obviously fabric is used instead of wood and metal. If the term miter causes you apprehension, there's a fearless way to approach the process. I'd like to share with you my favorite tips. When working with mitered corners, cut the borders extra long. Oh, eight inches is usually the uh, gauge that I use and center the borders. You're going to center them on each side. But before doing any stitching, on the wrong side of the quilt top, mark a fourth of an inch from each side, from each corner. And there's a little blue dot that I have marked at each four corners. Usually when I put borders onto a quilt top, I sew with the borders on top, the smallest part on top. This time I like to sew with the, with the quilt top facing me so I can see that little dot. I've already stitched two of the four borders on from dot to dot and I locked my stitches at this point. And then you can press it, we'll do a little bit later, the seam allowances toward the, the borders. And then cut the borders or that for the side seam, again, or at the side edges, longer than you need and center them on the border on the fabric, I should say, and then we're going to sew. Now, when I sew this, I have a straight stitch, and you have to get your fabric out of the way, meaning what you have just sewn, and then I'll just place this underneath the presser foot, and I have my machine set for a fourth of an inch seam allowance, sink the needle in the fabric, and then stitch, and let, let the needle dance a little bit at that spot, you know, just hit the button so that it is sewing in place and stitch. So in short, the long and short of this is that the fourth of an inch on each corner is not going to be sewn. And as I'm reaching my other corner and I get to the point, so a little bit slower so I can stop right at that dot. And then I'm just going to lock the stitches right at that point. Now comes the measuring part, which really is the pressing part. We'll press all seam allowances toward the borders. And that it will naturally want to go that way. Pressing it toward the borders. And then we'll do some magical folding. We'll shape the borders just the way we'd like it to be. I'm going to meet the raw edge of the top border to its partner right there and fold. Now let me just see if I'm getting that corner just right. And a little manipulation has to take place right here. You, you do some stitch, some pinning, and rather than measuring, I just make it look the way I'd like it to, see, like it to be. And then, after I have a nice miter, I press. And the press, pressing is going to be the stitching line for you. It's a press mark as we so often do in quilting. And I'll pin the borders together. And then I'm able to fold back the fabric and I see a line. And that press mark is where I'm going to do the sewing. So I have my machines set at a straight stitch. I'm going to move to the middle position and raise the presser foot and sew. You may want to consider working with a shorter stitch, or excuse me, not shorter, but a longer stitch length right now just to test it out in case you need to take it out. But as I finger press this open, oh, not bad. And you can see that it's mitered at that point. And you press this open. Now, another hint if you're working with a double border, as I have on my landscape quilt, I have this pressed as you can see, and sometimes it's really tricky to get right that point to match when you fold back the fabric. What I've done on this sample is I used a zigzag stitch and stitched down that fold. It's not going to look, not going to stay there. And I would loosen the tension on that zigzag stitch. What happens when you open this up and you flatten it out, you'll be able to straight stitch right down the fold. And I've already done that on this sample. Can you see how this folds out flat because I loosened the tension and I you can maybe see my straight stitch in this area? Let's see if I can find my bobbin thread and pull out the zigzag. And as I kind of pull that out, I guess it's still stuck there a little bit. 
There we go. There it's stitched and perfectly mitered, I think, at that corner. Borders can easily be an extension of the patchwork design. Using remaining fabric pieces, be inspired to stitch a piano keys border, a scrappy checkerboard border, or an artistic four patch border. As you can tell, we're on borders exclusively during this program of fearless quilting techniques. And these small placemat samples, we made them just so that you would look only at the borders and not be distracted by what's inside. Pay special notice that the width of these border elements will be one inch, and it makes it very easy to divide whatever you're working with that's in the interior. For example, if your, board, if your quilt is 96 by 106, you can get it. You can all be divisible by the one inch strips. So let me tell you what I, what I mean by this. We have chosen some fabrics, and the fabrics are just stacked here. The th four colors, there are actually four on, on here, and you can cut these in one inch strips. And let me get this lined up so that you cut, cut the fabric. And many times you have to fold the fabric in half. And we have fat quarters that we're working with right now. And you place this over the top, whether you're working with a traditional cutting board or, or a cutting board that can accommodate many strips at once. You don't have to move it. You place the rotary cutter in the teardrop end just slice down and I'm cutting one and a half inch strips. So I'll go from one and a half to three, four and a half, and I shouldn't have moved that. There we go. It's easier to cut on the flat surface than I have right here and then you have all your strips cut. And we've chosen colors that alternating light and dark. Now too difficult to figure out why. So on the piano keys technique you can see that here I've pieced together light and dark, light and dark, and then making a, a four section. And then you can really subcut this again, the width of the border that you'd like. And this border width happens to be two and a half inches, so that we just cut the strips two and a half inches and subcut them. And if you were making a lot of these, you could obviously s sew together many more strips so that you wouldn't have to do so much piecing at this time. And then just rotate and sew together so that you have a simple piano key looking border at the top and the bottom, north and south, and then add the same thing to the sides. And because they're one inch, they really work out well to fit most sizes, sizes of quilt tops or quilt projects. You could also work with two inches or three inches. You, you get the idea, but this piano keys is a nice looking border effect. Keeping in mind the same one inch strip of fabric that we've been using, you could also work with a checkerboard. Now the checkerboard from the same two configuration, you can create a four patch. And a four patch is simply this. Let me show you what they look like. And you've probably made four patches before if you've quilted. If you haven't, let me share how they're made. You stitch a light and a dark together of a strip and then cut the strip in half. It'd be a long 45 inch strip and turn so that you have a light going on top of a dark and a dark going on top of a light. And then line them up and subcut them again. You know, there's that bumper sticker that says quilters never die, they just go to pieces. Well, that happens with when you're working with patchwork. So I'm gonna cut these an inch and a half and slide this over and at home you can maybe cut a little bit more accurately than I'm managing right now. And then you just simply stitch these together. They come off as a pair, take them to the machine and just stitch it together. To create this one, we just made two different four patch configurations. A dark, and then this one is a little bit lighter and then alternate these as they go around. So you can see that's a fast way of adding a border just with some leftover fabrics. And last but not least, we have the artistic four patch where we've just placed as a cornerstone a four patch in the corner and then made the border an extension of what would normally be the next color. So little creativity just with one inch wide strips to offset to set off, not offset, to set off whatever you have in the middle of your quilt.
Today's Nancy's Corner guest is no stranger to our show. Usually she sits in the chair next to me to introduce us to her newest book in the Elm Creek Quilt series. Today she'll present us with a synopsis from her first historical novel outside the Elm Creek series called Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker. Please welcome back Jennifer Cheverini, a prolific author and a great person to tell us about a historical item that everyone's interested in now, right now. Well, that's true. Everyone is always in interested in the live of life of Mr. Lincoln. And, and right. uh, the real life, the, the heroine of this book was a real life woman. Uh -huh. And she had incredible insight into the Lincoln White House that historians and scholars find fascinating even to this day. And her name is Elizabeth. That's right. Her name was Elizabeth Keckley. And she was born in 1818 in Virginia as a slave. She was a very, very skilled seamstress, however, and mm -hmm. as the years went by and she followed one owner to another owner, um, traveling around the South, she made her way to St. Louis, where her owner finally said that, yes, she could earn enough money to buy her own freedom. So with her skill and with her needle, she earned enough money wow. to purchase her freedom and that of her son. Gives me goosebumps. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> tremendously fascinating. I first discovered Elizabeth when I was researching some of my other Elm Creek Quilts novels. Mm -hmm. And her story just fascinated me because she had such strong will and such talent. And she made her way to Washington, D.C., where she became first the dressmaker to Mrs. Jefferson Davis. And then oh. later, she became the dressmaker for Mary Lincoln. Now, I have to say, I haven't read this yet, and I'm putting that caveat in it because I just received this book recently. And you, you research this in many different places. Well, that's right. I always start with my research at the Wisconsin Historical Society, which is a, a wonderful mm -hmm. resource, a, a treasure trove of history and archives very, mm -hmm. very close to where I live. Sure. But I also relied upon Elizabeth Keckley's own words. In 1868, she published a memoir talking about her life as a slave and how she earned her freedom, but also giving away a lot of secrets about her years living in the Lincoln White House. Now, these days, we expect everyone to turn out right. a tell-all book, but in 1868, not so. So, unfortunately, this did damage some the relationship that uh, Elizabeth and Mary Lincoln shared for so many years. But when times were good, Lizzie and Mrs. Lincoln that was after the assassin assassination, and then later on, she did by mail some dressmaking. That's true, but Elizabeth was more than just her dressmaker. She was also her close friend and confidant. Oh, sure. You might have heard that Mary Lincoln was a little bit difficult to get mm -hmm. along with at times, but Elizabeth was able to not only tolerate her, but also in some ways bring out the better side of Mary Lincoln in many occasions. Elizabeth was there to see Mary Lincoln through the many tragedies oh. she's faced while she was in the White House. The death Which of a child, mm -hmm. the death of her husband, and several scandals. Mm -hmm. And when Mrs. Lincoln left the White House upon Mr. Lincoln's assassination, Elizabeth went with her and lived with her for a time in Illinois before returning to Washington to continue her dressmaking business. And as you said, their friendship continued uh, through the mail for many years after that until they were reunited later. And when she made clothes for Mrs. Lincoln, these were not everyday dresses. Well, she did take care of some items like that, but what she's most known for and what Mary valued her skills most for mm -hmm. were for creating the beautiful gowns that Mary Lincoln wore to balls and receptions and mm -hmm. inaugurations. And as Elizabeth said um, herself in an interview that she gave to the newspaper when she was in her 80s, her hands were the last to touch Mrs. Lincoln before she took the president's arm and was escorted off oh. to some grand occasion. Because Elizabeth not only sewed her gowns, but she sure. fixed her hair and arranged her uh. bouquets and did all of those uh, extra touches as well. Well, Jennifer, this is a read that I am looking forward to okay. having very soon, and I'm sure those of you who are fans of Jennifer through the Elm Creek series will find this equally as enchanting. Good. Well, I certainly hope so. I loved writing it and doing all the research, and I hope my readers enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Well, with that attitude, I know they will. Thank you for being with us. It was my pleasure. 
And thank you for joining us on this program of Sewing with Nancy. And you can find out more information about Jennifer and the, her Elm Creek series plus Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker on our website if you go to nancyzeman.com. All things Sewing with Nancy are there. And we will definitely direct you in the right direction. If you'd like to rewatch this program, you can always rewatch all our videos, or excuse me, 52 of our shows online. Just click and watch. Join us with social media as well. As I say with every show, thanks for joining me. Bye for now. Nancy has written a fully illustrated book entitled Fearless Quilting Finishes that includes all the information from this three-part series. It's $14.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com slash 2703. Order item number BK2703, Fearless Quilting Finishes, credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at nancyzeman.com to see additional episodes, Nancy's blog, and more. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Oliso. Sewing with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.